All right, well, Brandon, I'm super excited that we're here tonight to talk about the new book that you just put out, an edited collection of essays that you worked on with Tommy Shelby, That's right. another common friend of ours. Yes. And um, many people may not know this about me, but before I threw away my life to become a rock musician, <laughs> we were classmates for a period of time, right. which is the greatest distinction in African-American <laughs> studies that I ever achieved. I, I went to class with Brandon Terry, um, but you have now become a, a highly celebrated professor at Harvard and have put out this book and sort of uh, contemporaneously with it also edited the latest issue of the Boston Review, That's right. 50 years since MLK, right. and you contributed an essay of your own to that, MLK Now, right. which I think has a common theme with the book, which is recasting the way that we think about King in historical context sure. and enlivening some of the ideas of his that maybe haven't been talked about right. in those 50 years. So tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this project of rescuing King's legacy right. from what it's become. And uh, in that also, I think it may be a surprise to people that you perceive there to be anything inaccurate about the way that people think of King. What, sure. what is wrong with the way we imagine him and his thinking? So uh, Tommy Shelby and I came to this project and, and you know the book project is To Shape a New World, um, essays on the political philosophy of Martin Luther King. Uh, we came to this this project after years of teaching African-American political thought to undergraduates and graduate students. And inevitably, what we would tend to find is that you put Martin Luther King on the syllabus, um, students come into it with a lot of expectations about, you know, oh, this isn't really gonna be that interesting. We already know what he has to say about, you know, um, the, the problems of racism or social injustice in America. And there's nothing we can really learn from him. And they're much more interested in people that they, they think of before the class starts as ostensibly more radical thinkers um, or, or, or more creative uh, iconoclastic figures. And what they almost invariably come to find is that when you deal with Martin Luther King, you're dealing with a first rate intellectual, not just activist. So King was the author of about five books in his lifetime. Most people don't know that. Uh, each of those books are serious, sustained meditations on a wide range of issues from economic justice to civil rights to just war theory <laughs> to um, questions of, that, are, that are more in the range of moral and ethical philosophy. So things like uh, the meaning of love, the nature of love and what role it should play in contentious politics. Um, even questions about our political emotions, right? Which should, which should be our attitude towards anger expressed in public debate. And the more and more I taught this stuff and realized just how rich it was and how little of it was a part of mainstream philosophical debates and how little of it seemed to be uh, at work in the activist communities and public spaces, we just thought it would be great to convene some of the greatest thinkers working right now to spend some time with King's work and, and try to make it speak to our contemporary problems. And we surely have enough of how did that you, can speak to. How did you choose the contributors? And maybe give us an overview of the kind of diversity yeah, in those thinkers no, who are weighing in on King. Um, so we tried to pick people who had thought a fair amount about race and African-American political thought, uh, but not all of them had written extensively on this question. You know, they might mention it here and there. Um, and so it's an it's a, a astonishing group, really. Uh, Martha Nussbaum contributed an essay on love and anger in King's thought. Karuna Mantana on the origins of nonviolence in King's thought. So tracing it from the Gandhian context and the coterie of African-American intellectuals who had been interested in nonviolent uh, thinking in the early 20th century. Um, we've got Michelle Moody Adams from Columbia writing on conscientious citizenship. Lionel McPherson, a really talented African-American philosopher writing about just war. Uh, Cornell West contributes a fantastic uh, meditation on hope and pessimism in King's thought. Um, you know, my, my, my co-editor, Tommy Shelby, Derek Darby's in it, uh, Danielle Allen. It's just, a, I mean, an amazing, so amazing who's who? group. A who's who of m many of the leading figures uh, in, in, in the field right now, writing on questions of political ethics and mm -hmm. African-American philosophy. Um, and, you know, again, 
one of the things that, you know, particularly with the Bruin Institute, you know, I think it has a lot of overlap with the mission here. It's trying to diversify what people think of as political philosophy. Right. Right. And so that there are many questions and, and, and my co-editor, Tommy Shelby, has been referring to this tradition as the ethics of the oppressed. Right. That, you know, there's a certain kind of social contract tradition that focuses on trying to figure out the rules and principles of um, the kind of basic structure of society, the way we might arrange um, you know, the, the fundamental order of things. But there are these other questions, these other traditions, which are much more about contentious politics from below, the questions of how to live a good life in the context of severe oppression that's not likely to be mitigated uh, anytime soon. And that's a tradition we, don't, we, we lack access to in, in professional philosophy. And it really does impoverish our public life, mm -hmm. right? We have all of these protest movements going on, uh, reactionary movements going on, and you can see it in the media coverage. We don't have a common vocabulary to talk about the ethical stakes of activism, the ethical stakes of um, angry and contentious politics. There's no language for that that we're all familiar with because it's not at the forefront of our ethical curriculum. So let's talk about the discourse that you want to create mm -hmm. with this work and with the work you're doing as a professor and the work Tommy's doing in conjunction with you around King here, what would a uh, debate or uh, sure. environment of social activism look like that does responsibly take account of the historical traditions mm -hmm. you're uh, elucidating and the ideas in particular of King that may still be with us whether we know it or not? Right. So I'll say two things. One as a matter of practice, one is a matter of um, sort of more philosophical substance. As a matter of practice, I think if our, if our work helps push people toward anything, it would be returning to King's example as somebody who is an intellectual and an activist. And not just to make a fetish out of um, intellectualism, but to say that part of really successful movement building is writing and arguing in public. Right. It's laying out the justifications for why you're doing what you're doing, what kind of world you hope to build, because that's how people are able to make judgments about whether to ally with you or not, whether to risk everything they have to work with you or not. I mean, we're asking people to do those kinds of things. King goes to places and he asks people to risk their life and die, right, to give up. You know, Rosa Parks was run out of Montgomery within a year and a half. People don't know that part of her right. story, but she had to live in right. poverty in Detroit for years, right? She, her, her husband lost her, his job. She was run out of her work, right? That's severe consequences. And when you ask people to sacrifice like that, you can't just have them go off of a tweet or mm -hmm. an image of you in a magazine uh, or a charismatic speech that you made right before the march was supposed to start. You've got to lay out what it is you're doing. So explain to me the paradox of our present moment, and I'm gonna characterize sure. it in a way maybe you won't agree with, but in spite of what you just said, mm -hmm. maybe the most uh, electrifying political character of our decade is Donald Trump, the president. And in what seems to be a complete absence of rigorous thought or rigorous argument about the substantive motivations for his policies and the agenda that he campaigned on, people have rallied behind him, or at least a segment of the population mm -hmm. has been more mobilized maybe than they have been in recent memory. So how do you explain a moment right now where the figure that has attracted the most grassroots support, I mean, it's what this election was famously defined by, by a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, may be one of, whether you agree with them or not, the least academic or intellectual social activists um, in, in memory? Well, so, so I would slightly disagree with your characterization um, in one way, and then I'll say mm -hmm. something else. Um, I agree that it's not intellectually sophisticated, but there are ideas and arguments mm -hmm. that he mm -hmm. makes in public. Sure. And one of, the, one of the difficult things, and this is another thing I think we can learn from King, is that often we hear things that we judge reactionary or um, intolerant, distasteful, disgusting, and we shut down, our critical faculty shut down. We have a sense of revulsion and we want to hold it at arm's length. And because we don't really wade into the muck and mire of the ideas, our responses to it are not persuasive to the people who hold those views, mm -hmm. right? Um, you and I have talked about this before, but you know, 
when, when Donald Trump gives these speeches and afterward, the commentary is not about the things he said about trade policy, not about the things he said about immigration. They're not about the things he said about um, legal enforcement or sexual ethics. The coverage is about, you know, some offhand remark he made about Hillary Clinton, some insult he lobbed at Ted Cruz. And we're assuming that the people in the audience are listening to that, but they oftentimes they're listening to these other arguments and we have to beat those arguments. Sure. If you're not even attuned to listen to those arguments, you're not going to respond to them. So that's the first thing mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. So secondly, uh, Trump's asking people to sacrifice a much smaller uh, thing than mm -hmm. than left and egalitarian social movements are really going to ask people to do. He's asking you to get out, give small amounts of money, show up to rallies, vote in order to defend the kind of power and privileges that you've traditionally held uh, and that you feel are under assault from, uh, you know, forces in the world that are mm -hmm. beyond your control mm -hmm. and that you have a lot of disdain for. The left has to ask people to sacrifice a great deal to build a world that we've never seen uh, and that many people have faith cannot be built, right? They lack faith that it can sure. be built. Uh, that's a totally different order of magnitude of a political project, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. And it requires a level of commitment to persuasion, debate, and argument that the other side just simply doesn't need to generate. Now, in the tradition of black liberation politics, mm -hmm. the most recent episode that garnered a huge amount of attention in America was Black Lives Matter, sure. which you've also written about. Yes. And I'm interested in hearing your take on what may be common characteristics mm -hmm. of the Trump movement and Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and how Black Lives Matter relative to the Trump movement plays into the uh, philosophy of organizing that King defined. Do you view one, one is, uh, you know, perhaps more outwardly opposed to King's view, and that may counterintuitively be Black Lives Matter. Do you think that that's fair? And, and what have your critiques been of Black Lives Matter from the point of view of the ethics of organizing and um, direct action? Well, so, so, so first of all, I don't, I don't think that would be quite the right way to, to put it. So um, it, it seems to me that at the end of the day, Black Lives Matter is going to be closer to King on all substantive issues, which I know you mm -hmm. you would know. Mm -hmm. um, the points of friction, in some ways, are better on the Black Lives Matter side, mm -hmm. right? So when you got a question about trying to uproot sexism and homophobia from an egalitarian social movement, right? That's correct. And, and King and, and King did not yeah. effectively do that sure. at all. Mm -hmm. um, one of the essays that I wrote with uh, a, a good friend and colleague, Shatima Threadcraft, into Shape a New World is all about the, the problem of gender uh, and justice in King's political thought. And we try to develop the resources there that you could kind of work from within mm -hmm. King's political thought to do a lot. And, and there's a lot in his thought that I think is useful for the project of gender justice. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, Martin Luther King, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, they were they had a deep culture of sexism. Sure. Right? Uh, so those that's that's an advance. Um, I think the places where Black Lives Matter activists and, you know, it's hard to speak about it as one unified thing. There are many different wings and organizations, figures, efforts. So it's, it's hard to kind of sure. nail anything down. But the thing I think would be most productive point of contention are a couple of things. So, so one, I think King is much more disciplined in the sense of thinking through the problem of expressing anger as a question of virtue, right? And what kinds of things that indulging and cultivating a posture of anger over time can do to you in your own soul sure. and your own way of life, your own engagements with others. Um, that aren't that don't have to do with respectability politics. I think often sure. we, we throw that phrase around, and one of the things I've written about in Boston Review is just how um, inaccurate that term can be to respectability describe. Respectability politics is Evelyn Higginbotham's notion that right. at certain moments in the black civil rights movement there were efforts made to be more proper than your white adversaries, to be so unassailably acceptable in the culture of the elite that right. one could not 
withhold people privilege on the basis of their difference in that respect. Is that right? Right. Well, she uses it in two ways. So that's one way. And that way is primarily strategic, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. if you're Jackie Robinson, right. you know, you have this kind of bearing, this character, this unassailable um, dignity, dignified bearing that, that anybody who comes after you, I mean, it seems to narrow all the other variables down to sure. just you being a racist. And right. so that it seems very effective in lots yep. of ways. But of course, that sets up a dilemma, which is that anyone who can't meet that standard, you're sort of implicitly justifying mistreating those people, mm -hmm, right? It, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a logic that sets up exceptions sure. um, to be pulled out of the group uh, and allow the mistreatment of the rest of the group to continue. Now, Evelyn, I think also, uh, you know, she's, she's my colleague, and one of the things she also talks about in that in that chapter, which people have lost sight of, they, they talk a lot about the first part. But the second thing is that there's an age old concern with what you know Aristotle and uh, Aquinas and figures like that would think of as virtue, right? There's a question about how to live the good life. Sure. Are there ways of life that are better to live than others? Mm -hmm. um, are you a perfectionist about ethics or are you simply a relativist? Uh, most people are not relativists. Would you characterize Black Lives Matter, if you were to essentialize a critique of it as being relativistic, relative to King, that King had a more, and part of King's maybe lost historical stature is owed to the fact that, as you said, he doesn't seem as cool. He doesn't seem as aesthetically <laughs> right, right. adventurous or well, rebellious. I don't, I don't think people are relativist. I don't think they're relativist mm -hmm, either. Mm -hmm. they, they certainly think there are ways of living that are better than other ways. Sure. The problem is we've lost that vocabulary, mm -hmm. right? But do they believe that those ways of living that are better or worse than others are not aesthetic in the way that King might have? That you don't need to be in a suit to go and protest effectively, that if you're in a jersey dress, that is equally uh, appropriate for public attention. But again, intention. I mean, so again, you've got to, you know, they, a lot of people wouldn't want their, their position described that way, mm -hmm. but it's... It's just a, it's an inversion, right? So there are people who think that showing up in uh, kind of Afrofuturist garb, right, right, uh, t-shirts that have explicit pro-black slogans mm -hmm. is a better mode of aesthetic expression mm -hmm. than showing up in a conventional suit and tie, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So they're not... You know, it's, it's very hard, and this, I mean, this is a thing that, you know, the Aristotelian tradition has known forever. It's very hard to disentangle a uh, question of virtue and character sure. from ritual, mm -hmm. right? And so people are always going to link those two things. They're always going to have some intricate connection, but we've lost the vocabulary to talk explicitly about Now, let that. me ask you, have we, have we lost that tradition, or have we embraced another concept that you've thought a lot about, irony? Is, is the aesthetics of today ironic in a fundamental way that someone like King could never have imagined. Yeah. And b because of his absence of irony, he seems anachronistic to us somehow. I think, I think living on different sides of that break in popular and political culture is something that we don't think enough about. Mm -hmm. I think people in popular culture think about it a lot. Right, right. In journalism, but people in political philosophy don't quite get it. And I think partly they don't understand why they come off so odd to other people right. <laughs> because they act Total as Total lack of irony. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> they, they sort okay. of lost the yeah, yeah. a, a connection to the, to the idiom of the present. And so, uh -huh. you know, a, a key point of this, and this, you know, relates to King quite well, is like, you know, Vietnam is such a devastating moment for American popular and political culture. So to live on either side of Vietnam is to be in two different worlds. Mm -hmm. And so after Vietnam, Irony becomes more and more popular because you've got a level of civic distrust that's totally unprecedented in the U.S., right? So when people earnestly make claims or, you know, uh, proclaim their religious affiliations or claim to be moral exemplars, mm -hmm. the post-Vietnam world now distrusts that, right? You've got a journalism culture that they've seen what happens with Watergate. So now it's let's dig and mm -hmm, find mm -hmm. the lie behind the facade. Right. Uh, and that kind of stance of distrust, mm -hmm. you know, generates a certain kind of cultural response where people try to only be the facade. Sure. Right. Or treat it as if there is no reality, there is no authenticity all the way down. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 
And so in a, in a moment like that, King, I think, sometimes can come off too earnest, mm -hmm. uh, too staid in, in a way that doesn't connect with people. He doesn't seem, right. you know, hip what would it, What would an ironic King look like? Could his, <laughs> could his arguments survive translation into the idiom that you're talking about? Well, I hope so. Uh -huh. I mean, I hope so. And I think... I, that they would that they would survive in a particular way that they don't accept the terms of the culture, right? So the king is a moral perfectionist, mm -hmm. ethical perfectionist. He's always trying to force people to do a certain kind of self-inventory, critical self-interrogation about the wellsprings of their culture, about the, the, the order of their practices, mm -hmm. right? Um, so his challenge is not just to the society at large, it's to you personally, uh, you know, when he gets up, and this kind of stuff is things that we don't, we, you know, again, this is a vocabulary we don't use anymore. Um, very problematic that we don't. But when he gives the, the speech in Montgomery uh, to, to try to launch the bus boycott as part of the opening rally, he makes an argument that, you know, people of Montgomery, your dignity and self-respect is at stake with how you respond to this moment, right? It's not just because you're oppressed, doesn't mean that questions of ethics fly out of the window, that, that they're irrelevant, that the only thing to talk about is your oppression sure. and what the oppressors are doing. Like, there's a question about what you're gonna do, mm. right? That's all gonna be there. The question, mm -hmm. what, what do you do in the face of that? Du Bois has a line, he's, you know, how does, how does integrity meet oppression, mm. right? Um, those are questions that I think reach deep down into the to the kind of abyss of irony and if anything starts to pull people back from it it sure. would be that sure um, and that's not to say you, you you totally lose the insights of irony and so one of the things mm -hmm. i'm really interested in is how do you pass through a phase of irony and retain some of the key insights right that things aren't as they seem sure right like that is a fundamental yep. truth for criticism right right you have to be able to see beneath the appearances of sure. things but that can't you can't um, and, the, and the thing that I've sort of come to, that, that a lot of what motivates irony, I think, is actually a misguided and misplaced, almost metaphysical sense of purity is lurking always in the background, mm. right? Mm -hmm. That there's this purity, that it, the standard of purity that's being used to judge everything else. Mm. And that's kind of implicit in the criticisms that they make and the affective relation to the criticisms that they make. Um, but once you hold that metaphysical um, concept out in, out in the light and say, mm -hmm. this isn't a thing that we have to judge everything by. Sure. Just because our practices aren't perfect, just because this movement didn't fix everything about the world, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean we give up on trying to change what we can. It means think, we give think, up on think, this picture of purity. Do you think King bakes that idea in with original sin and the sort of Christian notions of individual fallibility? Uh, yeah, I mean, he's a Niebuhrian, mm -hmm. right? So Reinhold mm -hmm. Niebuhr is such a huge influence on King. And if his perfectionism is anything, it's tragic, right? It's groups are always going to commit forms of coercion and oppression that we can't abide by. Uh, people are always going to fail at their greatest aspirations. Uh, nobody's going to be totally perfect. Uh, we are all, I mean, this is a deeply Christian view, but I think a right one, that we're all greater than the worst thing we've ever done, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, that's all derived from a certain way of thinking about Christianity, not the only way, but mm -hmm. a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I think those are things that can survive without that metaphysical grounding but, and, and are just appropriate descriptions of the anthropology of what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the greatest thing I've ever done. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's great to see you, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, Thank you. you.